Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Nassie and today I'm at 17 Wing in Winnipeg having a look at an item that you've been wanting me to cover for quite some time. The venerable E6B flight computer, one of the few examples of a mechanical calculator, in this case a circular slide roll, still being widely manufactured and used today. So this is very similar to the marine computer we had a look at in a previous video in that it allows you to perform a number of simple ratio-based calculations such as time, speed, distance, and fuel burn far more quickly and accurately than you could using a pencil and paper, especially when you're flying. However, this also includes a number of other functions more specific to aerial navigation, such as correcting altitude and airspeed for atmospheric pressure and temperature, and determining the effects of crosswinds on your aircraft's course, all in a compact, convenient package that you can lay on your lap and use while you're flying. Now, the E-6B was invented in the mid-1930s by a U.S. Naval Reserve aviator named Lieutenant Philip Dalton, who, along with fellow U.S. Naval Officer Lieutenant Commander Philip Weems and Australian Navigator Harold Gaddy, was one of the major pioneers of aerial navigation techniques and instruments in the early 20th century. So Dalton was born in 1903. He obtained a Bachelor's in Engineering from Cornell and a Master's in Physics from Princeton, and his military career actually started out in the artillery, where, as a young cadet, developed a number of clever instruments for more accurately aiming guns. Unfortunately, his newfangled ideas weren't accepted by the more conservative army establishment of the time, so in 1929 he transferred over to the Navy and entered the Naval Flight Training Program, where he set his mind to solving some of the problems encountered in long-range aerial navigation. Now, at the time, aerial navigation was mainly based on older maritime dead reckoning techniques, and Dalton quickly realized that these were far too slow and cumbersome for use in a fast-moving aircraft. By the time you completed your calculations, you had already drifted too far off course for those calculations to be useful. So he set about developing a number of instruments that would allow these calculations to be performed far more quickly by a pilot in flight. And his first success was the VC-2 plotting board. And this was a little table that could be clipped to the wall of cockpit and had a rotating translucent disc on it that could be fitted over top of a map so that a navigator could plot all of their turns. And this is designed to allow an aircraft launched from an aircraft carrier or another warship to find its way back. The board also included a simple circular slide rule for performing speed, time, distance, and fuel burn calculations and different windows for writing down the particulars of the flight. The VC-2 was officially adopted by the U.S. Navy Hydrographic Board in June 1933 and soon became standard equipment aboard nearly all U.S. Navy aircraft, and it would serve all the way through the Second World War. Now, after serving for a year aboard the cruiser USS Northampton, Dalton returned to civilian life but continued to fly as a Naval Reserve aviator. But now he started developing a number of even more sophisticated navigational instruments, many of which he succeeded in also selling to the U.S. Army Air Corps, later to be renamed the U.S. Army Air Force. And the first of his successes was the Model B, which was a standalone version of the time, speed, distance, fuel burn dial from the VC-2 with true airspeed and altitude correction features added. In 1936, he added a wind drift feature to the back to create the E-1, which is officially adopted by the U.S. Army Air Corps. The E-1 series was further upgraded to produce the Mark 7, which received the U.S. Army Air Corps designation E-6B. This was also adopted by the British Air Ministry, who referred to it as the Dalton Dead Reckoning Computer or Dalton Navigation Computer. And the E-6B quickly became a standard and much-loved piece of equipment, with over 400,000 being produced between 1941 and 1945. And of course, it continued to be used well after the war, all the way to the present day. Unfortunately, Philip Dalton wouldn't live to see the success of his invention. Recalled into active military service in 1940, on July 24, 1941, he was killed on a training flight along with his student pilot near Hybla Valley in Virginia. Right, so let's have a closer look at the E6B and how it works. Now, this particular example belonged to my father. It was manufactured by Aero Products Research Incorporated of Los Angeles, California, and is dated 1971. And you'll find many different variations of the same basic design with fewer or more features depending on the intended use. And while this version is made out of aluminum, earlier versions will be made out of steel, and today you'll often find versions made out of plastic or even laminated cardboard. 
Now, on one side, we have our circular slide rule for performing speed, time, distance, and fuel burn calculations, as well as other corrections. Well, on the other side, we have a rotating azimuth circle and a slide for constructing wind triangles and compensating for the effect of crosswinds on the course of your aircraft. Now, starting with the main circular slide rule, or whiz wheel, as it's often known, as I said before, this is very similar to the marine computer we had a look at in a previous video. On our outer dial, we have distance in both nautical and statute miles, or alternatively speed in both miles per hour and knots, while on our inner dial, we have our time in both minutes and hours. Now, as this is arranged like a regular slide rule, you can also use the dial for performing simple multiplication and division calculations should you need to. Now, since slide rules are based on proportions, these sorts of problems would be set up as follows. For multiplication, multiplier 1 over 10 equals the product over multiplier 2. So if our problem is, for example, 2 times 4, we place 2, in this case 20, on the outer scale over 10 on the inner scale, then go over to 4 on the inner scale and find that our answer is 8. Similarly, a division problem is constructed as dividend over divisor equals quotient over 10. So for 8 divided by 4, we place 8 in the outer scale over 4 on the inner scale, then look above 10 on the inner scale to find that our answer is 2. Normally, however, you're going to be using this dial to determine speed, distance, time, and fuel burned based on the other known variables. So, for example, if our speed is 150 miles per hour and our elapsed time is 36 minutes, we find our distance covered by lying the speed or gallons per hour indicator on the inner dial with 150 on the outer dial. We then find 36 minutes on the inner dial and read out our answer, 90 miles. If instead our speed is 120 miles per hour and our distance to be covered is 200 miles, to find the time required to cover this distance, we set the speed or gallons per hour indicator to 120, then find 200 miles on the outer dial and read our answer of 100 minutes or 1 hour 40 minutes. If our elapsed time is 2 hours or 120 minutes and our distance covered is 200 miles, then to find our speed, we set 120 minutes on the inner dial across from 200 miles on the outer dial, then look at the speed or gallons per hour indicator to find our answer of 100 miles per hour. All these same calculations can be performed for fuel burn if miles per hour or knots is replaced by gallons per hour. Also, the conversion between nautical and statute miles or between knots and miles per hour is accomplished using these little conversion arrows here. For example, if we set the speed or gallons per hour index to 1, then go over to this conversion scale and slide the graduation under not over to stat, looking back at the index, we see that 1 nautical mile equals 1.15 statute miles. There are similar conversion indices for U.S. or imperial gallons to liters and for nautical and statute miles to kilometers. At the bottom, there is also a separate scale for converting between statute and nautical miles and between Fahrenheit and Celsius. So far, so identical to our nautical computer, though, like I said before, there are a number of other features more specific to aerial navigation. For example, this window here allows you to convert indicated airspeed, what appears on your airspeed indicator, to true airspeed, which changes depending on atmospheric pressure and temperature. So for example, if our pressure altitude is 10,000 feet, our ambient temperature is 0 degrees Celsius, and our indicated airspeed is 150 miles per hour, we line up the 10,000 feet on the lower scale with 0 degrees on the upper scale, then look above 150 miles per hour on our inner dial to find our true airspeed of 176 miles per hour. This dial also allows us to calculate our density altitude, that is pressure altitude corrected for temperature. For example, with the settings we've just chosen, 10,500 feet. This window can also be used to convert airspeed to Mach number, your speed relative to the local speed of sound, and vice versa. To find our Mach number index, we have to rotate the disk over to the far side of the pressure altitude scale. Now, if our air temperature is 0 degrees Celsius and our Mach number is 0 0.9, we align the Mach number index with 0 degrees, then look above 0.9 on the inner dial to find our true airspeed of 580 knots. Moving on, this window here is used to calculate our true altitude, that is, our altitude above mean sea level. For example, if our pressure altitude is 8,000 feet, our nearest ground station has a known altitude of 5,000 feet, and our air temperature is minus 19 degrees Celsius, we first subtract the two altitudes to yield 3,000 feet, set our pressure altitude of 8,000 feet opposite minus 19 degrees, then read opposite 3,000 feet on the inner scale to find a corrected altitude of 2,800 feet. We then add this to 5,000 feet to get the corrected true altitude of 7,800 feet. 
And finally, this last window here is for off course calculations that is determining how to get back to your original course if you've happened to drift off of it. For example, if we've drifted 40 miles off course and covered 350 miles in the process, to find the angle we need to turn parallel to our original course, we align 350 miles on our inner dial with 40 on our outer dial and read off our angle to parallel inside the window, 6.5 degrees. Now, let's say instead that we want to intercept our original course at a given distance, say 180 miles. We align 180 on the inner dial with 40 on the outer dial to yield an angle of 12.5 degrees. We then add this to our course parallel angle to yield a total intercept angle of 19 degrees. So that's pretty much it for the main dial. Now, if we flip over the E6B, we find a plotting board for determining the effects of wind on your aircraft's course. Specifically, this allows you to construct a wind triangle, which is a vector addition of an aircraft's true heading and the wind vector to yield the aircraft's drift angle and ground track. And you can use this construction in a number of different ways. For example, to determine your wind vector, to determine how far you'll drift off course over a certain amount of time, or most of the time to determine your wind correction angle, which is how far you need to turn into the wind in order to maintain your desired ground track. And normally your wind vector, that is its speed and direction, is obtained from weather reports, though you can determine it in the air by measuring your ground track using an instrument called a drift sight. And as luck would have it, I have an entire video on those instruments, linked in the description. Right, so this side of the instrument consists of three basic components. We have a transparent rotating azimuth disc. We have a reference mark at the center of the azimuth circle called the grommet and an aluminum slide with a grid composed of radially arranged drift angle lines and concentric speed circles. We also have a little plastic lever on the side for locking the azimuth circle in any desired position on the slide. So for example, let's say our planned true course is 340 degrees, the reported wind vector is 35 degrees at 30 miles per hour, and our true airspeed is 140 miles per hour. What wind correction angle should we apply and what will be our ground speed? Right, so we first turn our azimuth circle to 35 degrees. We then slide the circles so that the grommet lands on any convenient reference line, in this case, 120 miles per hour. We then count up from this line by 30 miles per hour, our wind speed, and place a pencil mark at 150 miles per hour on our true index line. We then rotate the azimuth circle to our true course, in this case, 340 degrees, then move the circle along the slides the wind dot lines up with our true airspeed, 140 miles per hour. The dot now lies on the 10 degree drift line, indicating a wind correction angle of 10 degrees, while our grommet lies on the 120 miles per hour speed circle, indicating that our ground speed will be 120 miles per hour. We can also use the E6B to determine our wind vector. So for example, if we know from using a drift meter, inertial guidance system, GPS, or other method that our ground track is 40 degrees, and our ground speed is 145 miles per hour, and we know from our compass and airspeed indicator that our true heading is 48 degrees, and our true airspeed is 166 miles per hour, we can determine that our wind correction angle, the difference between our true course and true heading, is 8 degrees. We first turn the azimuth circle to our true course of 40 degrees, then move it along the slide until the grommet lines up with our ground speed of 145 miles per hour. Then we place a pencil dot on the intersection of 8 degrees right wind correction and our true airspeed of 166 miles per hour. We then rotate the azimuth circle until the wind dot lines up with the true index line and move it so that the grommet lines up with a convenient reference line. We can then read that the wind vector is 90 degrees at 30 miles per hour. And finally, if we flip over our slide, we see that we have another wind drift grid that is specially calibrated for use at speeds over 200 miles per hour, where compressibility becomes an issue. There's also a separate grid on the bottom for calculating the effects of tail or headwinds. Now the top is a table for correcting true airspeed for compressibility. For example, if our true airspeed is 250 knots and our pressure altitude is 20,000 feet, we look at the intersection of 250 and 20,000 on the table to find an F correction factor of 0.98. We then multiply this by our true airspeed, yield a corrected airspeed of 245 miles per hour. And that, in a nutshell, is how you use the E6B flight computer. Now, it takes a little bit of getting used to at first, but with a little bit of practice, it becomes remarkably quick and easy to use, while having the further advantages of being very lightweight and compact and not needing any batteries, which was exactly Philip Dalton's intention. So no wonder this became as popular as it was and continues to be. 
And apparently this will continue to be used in aerospace for hundreds of years to come because an E6B actually appears in several episodes of the original Star Trek series. Now, as an added bonus, I went through the collection here at 17 Wing and found some other examples of flight computers from the past. So for example, this is a Dalton Dead Reckoning computer or Dalton Navigation computer Mark 3C. And this was one of many variations of the original Dalton Model G that was used by British Commonwealth Air Forces during the Second World War. So if you look on one side, we have our standard calculator dial, which allows us to perform our speed, time, distance, and fuel burn calculations. And we also have our two windows for correcting altitude and airspeed. However, there is no Mach number conversion capability or a window for calculating drift angle. And if we flip the cover over, we see that we have our plotting board for constructing wind triangles. Though instead of having the azimuth circle sliding over a piece of aluminum, instead the grid is printed on a piece of paper between these two spools, which you advance by turning this knob. Now apparently the US Army Air Force wasn't satisfied with this design, they found it cumbersome to use and expensive to manufacture, Hence why Dalton developed the E6B format for this instrument, but otherwise they work exactly the same way. And some of these versions will come with a little notebook that fits inside the lid and a handy pencil holder. And while this is feature is missing on this particular example, these typically had a pair of wooden cradles on the bottom and a pair of straps so you could securely strap this to your leg. Moving on, we have a World War II RAF RCAF computer height and airspeed Mark II, which only performs the functions of the altitude and airspeed correction windows on the E6B. And finally, we have a jet computer type B26 manufactured by the Battery Computer Company of New York City. And this was designed by Hungarian immigrant Oscar Battery, who in 1945 patented a design for a generic circular slide roll, and later began collaborating with Raymond Nardin of the Swiss instrument maker Ulysse Nardin, and produced a series of flight computers and other navigational instruments, the earliest advertisements for which I could find date to 1955. As the name suggests, this is designed for use in supersonic jet aircraft, so rather than simply lying on the pilot's lap or being strapped to their leg, which might present problems if you have to eject, this is instead fixed on a swiveling bracket mounted to the wall of the cockpit. Also, all the values on it are calibrated for higher Mach numbers. Now, on one side, we have our regular slide rule for performing time speed distance calculations, a Mach number converter, and windows for determining true altitude and true airspeed and determining density altitude. And on the other side, we have a dial for performing fuel burn calculations and determining wind drift angles. Now, while the E6B and its derivatives are by far the most popular model of flight computer on the market, there were dozens of other designs based on very different mechanical principles developed over the years, including the Bygrave, the Thurston and Sweeney, the Addison and Luard, the Plath, and the Jepson. And if I manage to get my hands on any of those, I will for sure feature them on this channel. Now, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you to 17 Wing for allowing me to root through their collection and have a look at these fascinating flight computers. I'll see you next time in another video or look at yet more navigational instruments and other fascinating devices just like these. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.